Your Excellencies, Dean, colleagues, and friends. Uh, I'm uh, Kong Yun Fong, Vice Dean for Research and Lee Ka Shing Professor of Political Science at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. And on behalf of the school and the Lowy Institute, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's launch of the Lowe Institute Asia Power Index 2019. When Dr. Michael Fully Love, Executive Director of the Institute, approached us about participating in this launch, we said yes immediately and enthusiastically, not only because Michael and I go way back to his Oxford days, but primarily because I'm a real fan of the index. So allow me to share a personal anecdote about how that came about. Last year, this time, I was struggling to write a paper for the British journal International Affairs on how power in world politics has changed in the last 100 years. Truth be told, my teacher Joseph Nye has cornered the market on power. Soft, hard, smart, sharp. What have you? He has written a book on all of these things, so what else is there for me to write about on power, right? As I did my research, I stumbled upon the lowest just released Asia Power Index and their findings um, on which uh, Michael and Hervey and Bonnie will regale you uh, later. They resonated so seamlessly and brilliantly with my evolving ideas that the index occupied a very prominent place in the eventual essay. Without the index, I think the essay would have been much more wooly and wishy-washy. Now, I marveled at the methodological rigor, the transparency, and the gumption of the index. Let me just say something about the gumption part. All measures of national power face a vexing conundrum. And that is, when you say that country A has X, Y, Z power, it begs a question. Does that tell us anything about its ability to achieve the political outcomes that it wants? In other words, is power like money fungible? The answer by the leading theorists of power is yes, but only to a very limited extent because so much depends on the issue or the context. Having nuclear weapons, for example, is not much help in persuading OPEC to lower its oil prices. Right. The Asia Power Index seems dissatisfied with this issue-oriented way out of the problem, preferring instead to confront the challenge head-on by going beyond just relying on the, our traditional measures of power resources, such as the size of the economy, military spending, and so on. And they do this by coming up with measures for four types of influence, not just resources, what they call cultural influence, diplomatic influence, defense networks, and economic relationships. So if you score high on these measures, you are presumably better at converting your resources into desired political outcomes. And Lowy had the nerve to combine these measures of influence with the traditional measures and then sum them up into a single metric for each of the 25 countries that they treat. This is a very impressive achievement for those of us who study these things. The index tells you about A's ability to achieve its outcomes better than most similar studies out there. Let me end then, let me end then on a slightly different note. As I worked on my essay, I had to settle on an acronym for the Asia Power Index instead of repeating it every time. The acronym happens to be API or API. And for those of you familiar with Bahasa Indonesia or Malaysia, API means fire. Although I would wish otherwise, 
you have to wonder whether this might be an apt metaphor for the geopolitics of Asia in the decades to come. On that somber note, I'll better hand over the stage to Dr. Michael Fulilov. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, ambassadors, high commissioners, consuls general. First of all, thank you very much, Professor Kong Fung Yuan, Prof Kong, for that kind introduction. As Yuan hinted, you, he was one of my professors at Oxford, one of my favourite professors, and it's delightful to see him again today. Thank you for what you said about the gumption of the index. That's, um, that's something we pride ourselves on, is gumption and ambition and a bit of audacity. Thank you for pointing out, um, I know that the Singaporeans always love acronyms, so I, I knew that you would come up with something like API. Thank you for pointing out the, what it means in, in Bahasa, API. It's funny you mention that because today Hervé was interviewed, Hervé Lemahieu was interviewed by BBC World and the background, it's quite, it's quite funny if you want to look it up, the background on the stage is of the world as presented as a ball of fire. And I did have to say on Twitter, let me just, main, let me just make clear for the record that that's not a finding of the Asia Power Index that the world is going to explode. But perhaps we were asking for it, Prof Kong. Thank you also to the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School, Professor Danny Kwa, who's with us this evening. We're delighted to collaborate with your school, so thank you, for, Professor. Welcome, everybody, to this global launch of the second edition of the Lowy Institute Asia Power Index. Everybody joining us online, as well as people here this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, when former Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull gave the keynote speech at the 2017 Shangri-La Dialogue, he paid tribute to Lee Kuan Yew's wisdom and his insights on the relations between states and indeed also on the relations between people and even animals. Mr Turnbull reminded us that in 1966, when Singapore was but a year old, Prime Minister Lee cited the old Chinese saying, big fish eat small fish and small fish eat shrimps. And after independence, uh, Prime Minister Lee initially saw Singapore as a shrimp, but he concluded after thinking about it that Singapore could make itself unpalatable to bigger fish by becoming self-reliant and strong, and Singapore could make friends with other fish through strong alliances and collective security. So this was a wonderful insight, and I'm pleased to say that our Asia in Power Index covers both of those elements are making friends and making yourself unpalatable, but we also cover everything in the ocean, the shrimp and the fish, both great and small. And we show, I think, that even the smallest nation can swim with the big fish if it is nimble and savvy. Ladies and gentlemen, global wealth and power are moving eastwards towards Asia, and we need research tools to track that nature the nature, the speed, and the extent of that shift. And that's why three years ago, the Institute commenced work on this ambitious Asia Power Index. Last year, we launched the first edition in the United States at the Asia Society in New York. We went to Washington, we briefed it to the White House, to the Pentagon, to the intelligence community, where a senior CIA analyst told us it was the best attempt at quantifying power that he had ever seen. We took the index around Australia, but also to the World Economic Forum in Davos, to Bangkok and to Beijing. This year, we decided to launch the second edition of the index here in Singapore. Why? Because of Singapore's strategic location, because of the canniness of Singaporean strategic policy dating back to Lee Kuan Yew, and because many of us admire what Singapore has made of its strategic circumstances. And if you're coming to Singapore, then why not come to the Lee Kuan Yew School and why not come in the week of the Shangri-La Dialogue? Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to pay tribute to uh, Hervé Lemahieu, the Director of the Asian Power and Diplomacy Program, a very impressive young scholar who's shown enormous intelligence and wit in leading a small team to produce this first class product. I'd also like to pay tribute to Bonnie Bly, uh, the research fellow on the project and Hervé's partner in crime. I also want to mention other colleagues at the Institute who've played a role because this has been a whole of Institute effort. I'd like to mention Anthony Bubalo and Alex Oliver, successive uh, research directors while the index has been developed. 
but also other colleagues like Roland Raja, um, uh, Lydia Papandreou, uh, Aaron Bassett, and many others. Let me tell you how the rest of the evening will work. I will invite Hervé Lemmer here to come up and give us a, a short, sharp summary of the findings of the index, and then I'll chair a panel to discuss the findings. So let me hand over to Hervé Lemmer here. Thank you. Thanks very much. So it's time for the big reveal. The screens are descending in a very sort of slow but suspense-filled manner. In the meantime, let me just um, tell you, we know that Asia's economic transformation is changing the distribution of power globally. We didn't know how fast, we didn't know uh, in what domains of power, and uh, we didn't know where this would lead. But it's very clear, even if you look at GDP, in 1995, uh, four of the largest five economies globally were situated uh, in the transatlantic space. And they were the United States, uh, followed by four of its treaty allies. Today, three out of the four largest economies are in Asia. China, if you take it at purchasing power parity levels, has already exceeded uh, the US in economic size. India is the third largest economy globally and Indonesia will level Germany by 2023. And in parallel, we know that there are tensions brewing in our region, which will determine the course of, of war and peace in the 21st century. So against this backdrop, and for a second year running, Bonnie and myself have assessed 25 countries uh, with not only what they have, but also what they do with what they have, and that's a critical, critical distinction. We go as far west as Pakistan, as far north as Russia, and as far into the Pacific as Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. Now, it's not just economic resources that we think matter to uh, our assessment of power. We think there are at least eight uh, thematic distinctions to be made uh, here. We have uh, military capability. Uh, we have resilience, by which we mean the capacity to deter real or potential threats to state stability. That's particularly pertinent for the, for the shrimp out there. Um, we've got future resources, which looks at the projected distribution of economic, military, and demographic uh, resources. Why? Because that already impacts our perceptions of power today. And as I said, it's not just what countries have, it's what they choose to do with what they have in terms of diplomatic networks, in terms of their economic relationships, in terms of their defense diplomacy, and finally, but, but certainly not last, in terms of their cultural influence. So we have 126 indicators, 30,000 data points, and when we map all of that, we come to an assessment of the distribution of power in Asia, which looks something like this. Now, three big trends before we move into the, the country results. One is we are picking up on the fact that the international order is changing from an open and consensual one uh, since the fall of the, the Cold War to one defined more by competition and zero-sum politics, certainly between the largest players. Two, I think globalization will continue uh, in this period of great power uh, competition, but perhaps not involve China and the United States together. What that means is a more hazardous variant of globalization dominated by spheres of economic influence. Three, and somewhat paradoxically, it means that middle powers become more important to the balance of power in negotiating their relationships with the two largest players uh, that are gridlocked. Um, and as they have to deal with a region in which U.S. strategic predominance is fading and China's uh, ambitions are sharpening. So what does this mean in terms of five big results? Because as I say, we have limited time and I will just canvas what we think are the, are the, big, the big results for this year. The United States remains the preeminent power, but in our assessment has become a net underachiever. By that I mean it is still the largest military, uh, military force in the world and in, in the region. Um, it is also um, a cultural influence in our region, a cultural influencer in our region, not just in terms of the exports of cultural goods and services, uh, in terms of movies and music, but also in terms of the way that the information landscape is wired uh, in Asia. People still consume English news. If you look at where uh, countries in Southeast Asia devour their foreign media, it tends to be American publications. Um, even if you're reading about Chinese politics, you're not necessarily reading Chinese publications about American politics yet. That's a, a critical distinction. But 
The problem comes with the revisionist economic agenda of Washington and the clash that that presents in terms of um, the traditional consensus-based leadership the preeminent power used to forge in our region. And one of the biggest upsets for the United States this year is that it's ranked third behind both China and Japan in terms of its diplomatic influence. And if you want to look at foreign policy in particular, um, the United States lags even further behind in 11th place. Um, and on top of that, as, as Professor Kong was already alluding to, in our assessment of the power gap, uh, the United States has become a net underachiever. Now, what does that mean? It means that the US should perform better, according to our model, uh, than it does on the basis of its size and its resources. You'll notice that China is also an underachiever. And it tends to be the smaller players, like Japan, uh, like India, oh, sorry, not India, like, like Singapore, that tend to be the overachievers in our region because smaller powers band together to pursue their geopolitical interests. And it explains why the region uh, is more than just a two-player game. There, is, there are other players here. There are India and Japan in particular, which form a separate, um, uh, separate placement in our rankings as major powers. And what we see is that uh, Japan is a classic uh, overachiever. Um, whilst um, it um, is lagging in military capability, um, it does much better in terms of its diplomatic influence. And uh, in that sense, we think it's a quintessential smart power, using the country's limited resources to wield a top four ranking across the four influence measures. Now, maintaining a liberal order has become a key organizing principle under the premiership of, of Shinzo Abe. And Tokyo has successfully resuscitated trans the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was an ambitious free trade agreement first led by the United States. But in the absence of that kind of multilateral initiative taking by the US, Japan has filled a void. Now, where do we stand on China? Because China, the emerging superpower, netted the highest gains in, overall, in our overall assessment. And I'm just going to go into its uh, profile here. Uh, for the first time, um, China ranked first in our assessment of economic resources, and that's despite a slowing growth rate. The world's largest trading nation has also paradoxically seen its GDP become less dependent on exports. What does that mean? It probably means that China is less vulnerable than many other countries in our region to the escalating trade war. Access to Western markets will likely prove increasingly marginal as well to the global ascendancy of Chinese tech. Why? Because China's economy has shifted to a domestic consumption model, making large-scale implementation of new technologies like 5G easier to achieve at home. But more importantly, China has also become the largest source of foreign investment in developing countries, which means it can roll out its technologies um, in emerging markets. So if I have a look at the levels of the relative importance of China as a foreign investor, uh, in the countries of a region, it's quite noticeable. Um, and this is as a percent, um, the strides that it's making in its immediate neighborhood. Now, what does this mean in terms of military capability as well? China still lags the United States, but it's chosen to concentrate its resources and modernization efforts on its near abroad in contrast to America's global military posture. Uh, within its region, China's defense budget is 56% larger than ASEAN, Japan, and India combined. So you can have a look at that here in terms of defense spending. India is another quite interesting result. Um, what it lacks in influence, it makes up for in scale. And I think the best comparison or point of comparison is with Japan. So if I go to Japan and I compare it with India, the two powers almost present mirror images of each other. Japan is an overachiever in terms of cultural influence, in terms of its defense diplomacy, in terms of its economic relationships in the region, uh, and even in terms of its diplomatic influence, where it's ranked second. India ranks highest in terms of the sheer scale uh, of the economic size of the country. Uh, its military capability is ranked fourth. Its resilience is ranked fourth as well. Uh, and its future resources are bright. It's going to add over 200 million people to its working age population by 2045. 
Where it lags, however, is in diplomatic influence, where it's down by two rankings. Uh, in economic relationships, which suggests that Narendra Modi's Act East policy lacks substance. Um, and in terms of its defense diplomacy, we know it's, non it's a non-aligned country, but it's uh, meant to be doing more even in terms of its non-allied partnerships. What about other countries that have done well? It's notable that North Korea is, uh, has made the most gains uh, behind China. The nuclear power jumped five rankings in diplomatic influence um, just in the last year since the uh, first summit took place between the United States and uh, uh, well, Donald Trump and, and Kim Jong-un. Now, it starts from a low base. It was ranked in 21st place uh, for diplomacy last year. Um, and now it's, it's ranked uh, five places higher than that. What does that suggest? It suggests to us that summit diplomacy, ostensibly on equal terms with the United States, has elevated and partly normalized North Korea's regional standing. So if I go into North Korea's uh, profile here and have a look at where it made the most progress, um, it tends to be in um, uh, things like its diplomatic influence, where it's jumped five places, but also in our assessment of its future resources as what it really wants is a lifting or a relaxation in the international trade uh, sanctions regime. But in the absence of that, uh, the relaxation in its enforcement is already enough of a concession uh, to register an uptick in its, in its outlook uh, for its economy. It has also advanced in military capability by one ranking, and this is rather ironic because we are no further along to denuclearization. To the contrary, uh, we've estimated that North Korea has produced enough fissile material to build 12 new nuclear weapons uh, since the first summit. So it has not uh, uh, compromised on its hard power, but it has gained uh, on its influence in the region. There is an interesting mix of other middle powers that have made strides um, over the last year. Uh, Malaysia, in particular, has fared better um, under the, the, the Prime Minister Mahathir. His surprise return last year really shifted things around and left China uh, rather perplexed as well as to where Malaysia stood in, with regard to the Belt and Road Initiative. But again, it suggests that uh, there's a new emphasis on um, trying to get better terms from uh, China's largesse. Um, and Malaysia, and not just Malaysia, Myanmar as well, was successful in renegotiating the terms of flagship Belt and Road Initiative projects uh, in favor of the borrower, uh, and which suggests that actually uh, China's uh, inability to convert its econ economic soft power into bigger leverage or uh, more influence in other domains uh, remains in question and rather limited. Um, Vietnam has also scored incredibly well. Um, Vietnam has made strides in its military capability. It's also acceded to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's played a much more robust role in terms of its economic diplomacy. That contrasts heavily with uh, Taiwan, which is the only territory uh, in our index that has registered a downward shift uh, in, it, in our assessment of power. Why is that? It's become, the diplomatic outcast has become even more isolated. It lost uh, two diplomatic allies last year when we mapped uh, the number of countries it has diplomatic relations with, which are a small grouping anyway. Um, and on top of that, the relative scale of Taiwan faced with the military modernization efforts of China is diminishing. And that is actually uh, something that's rather worrying for people concerned with the balance of power in Asia, because Taiwan remains a core check on the ambitions of China to become a full-fledged maritime power. There are silver linings, for, however. Taiwan um, ha, is up in technology. It's also up on defense diplomacy uh, as a result of uh, its exchanges with the United States. The final point I want to make um, is that um, ASEAN centrality and the big tent diplomacy convened around it is often dismissed as an inadequate and anachronistic uh, mechanism for managing great power politics. Um, however, I think I, uh, Taiwan offers a case in point that suggests that its absence from those same multilateral forums proves that regionalism still carries geostrategic benefits for those inside the Big Ten diplomacy. Eight out of ten ASEAN countries registered upward trends in their overall power score in 2019, and I think that is rather counterintuitive. So whilst there is often a temptation to reduce the complexity of Asia's international order to a two-player game, in reality, I think the Indo-Pacific system is sustained by and created by, by a much wider array of actors. And that's what we hope uh, we've uh, given you a sense of today with this uh, latest edition of the Asia Power Index. Thanks very much. Terrific. Thank you, Hervé. I think you've got a sense of um, both the insights that, that fall out of the index, but also the richness of
the interactive version of the Institute. And let me encourage anyone who's interested to, to check out the URL, check out the index at power.loweinstitute.org because you can see just in the way that Hervé manipulated it, the ability to play with it, to change the weightings if you wish, to compare individual countries, to dig down to the indicator levels is very impressive. Let, let me invite the other panellists to join um, the, the stage, if you would. Let me ask e each of Prof Kong and Prof Bajpai, what did you make of the overall findings? And perhaps I'll start with you, uh, Ewan. To what extent did it conform with your understanding or your perception of the balance of power in Asia? To what extent did it differ? Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Michael. Uh, it conforms perfectly with my understanding. That's why I like it so much. <laughs> um, I think, uh, let me just share a couple of thoughts. Uh, one uh, is that the index shows clearly that Asia is bipolar. And this is actually a very important finding because if you have been following how analysts and decision makers in the region talk about the region, the dominant characterization is that it is multipolar or trending in that direction. So the Lowy index disagrees and says that it is bipolar. The second point I wanted to share is that now bipolar situations are associated with geopolitical rivalry as well as military conflict. Think of the US-Soviet Cold War competition and the wars in Korea and Vietnam. Not very reassuring. Will this logic then, if this is a bipolar system today, be replicated in the coming Cold War between the US and China? The geopolitical competition, yes, it is happening. For me, this will be a struggle for the number one position or hegemony in Asia. The US wants to maintain its hegemony, and China wants to displace it in due course. This is quite natural in the course of international politics. Whether it will lead to a military clash is harder to say. It depends in part on how fearful the US is of China's rise. It depends on how patient or impatient China might be. It depends on the alignment choices of states in the region and a host of other imponderables. I have other uh, thoughts I would like to share, but I think I'll stop there. Great. I, I want to bring uh, Hervé and Bonnie in on some of your points, but let me first go to Prof, Prof Badgepai. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I mean, I think uh, seeing the United States and China at the top was not particularly surprising, but it's, it's good to see that uh, confirm. But I thought two or three things struck me as a bit unusual. Um, the first is that if you look at the Eurasian landmass, there's basically no competition. Uh, China and, the United, uh, and, and Russia dominate the landmass enormously from Vladivostok uh, pretty much up to the Baltics, right? certainly in the Asian landmass. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, whether India rises or not, India is not a player in uh, the Eurasian landmass, cut off by the Himalayas and by Pakistan. So, with China's rise and a sort of rehabilitation of Russian power, uh, the Eurasian landmass has basically fallen, if I could use those words, under the sway of China, the China-Russia partnership. So I think this very much shows that to be the case. The second is that if you look at the numbers, the United States and its allies and quasi-allies in 2019 um, basically have either not seen an increase in power or have fallen in power. Uh, whereas the countries that have increased in power are China, Russia, and North Korea. So the entire sort of uh, Western, uh, Western inclined system led by the United States has either stagnated or has declined in power. So that's another interesting uh, point, I, I, I thought. Um, I was surprised that all the Southeast Asian countries I think Hervé made this point, uh, have increased in power. And um, it may surprise people, but it surprised me uh, that Singapore sits atop uh, all 10 ASEAN countries as the most powerful uh, country. So the little red dot, uh, despite the size of, you know, of Indonesia and so on, actually comes out on, on top in terms of its, its power. And I think uh, 
for the region that's interesting. I'll just finish with one other thought that I thought, uh, and I shared this earlier with the, uh, with the team, uh, which I found a bit anomalous given China's rise and its, and its spot, which is that this year Chinese military power has actually declined. And so I thought it'd be nice for the audience to kind of get the interpretation of, of the group on why that's the case. So China's rising, but its military power actually fell off this year. So I'll just stop there. Terrific, thank you. A great set of questions. Let me, I might go to Hervé on, on some of those and let, give you a shot at, at some of them. I, I think the, the question of the bipolarity of the region and whether this inclines the region towards conflict, perhaps some sort of um, uh, Cold War style conflict. And of course, we are also seeing the decoupling in many ways of, of US and China. So Hervé, you might address that. Uh, Prof Bajpai had these interesting points about the, the Eurasian landmass being dominated by China, a, a relative decline of the Western inclined um, part of parts of Asia compared to China, Russia and North Korea, and then of course Singapore. And I might say that we didn't rig the numbers to, to complement Singapore because we knew that we were launching it this year. Singapore always does very well, always punches above its weight, to use that, that, that phrase for, for reasons that I might, uh, might invite Hervé to tell us about. Sure, so thanks, and, and incredibly uh, interesting remarks there. Um, I'm fully uh, I, I'm surprised as well to see the degree to which, the sort of, as you call it, the Western inclined block uh, has remained stagnant. In some sense, it's, it's what we know. Um, we're talking about developed markets who are not growing at the same rates. Um, it, other than Australia, um, uh, these countries are no longer growing demographically either. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's, it's expected, but it's, it's a stark reminder of, of what's happening in terms of relativities. Um, the region is inherently bipolar. Uh, I, I agree. Um, I think we are heading towards uh, a new chapter in great power politics where, under most plausible scenarios, short of conflict, the US and China, uh, well, the US will not be able to, 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 to halt the, 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 the power differential, the narrowing power differential between itself and China. Um, I actually think that that still engenders opportunity, though, for middle powers. And that may also explain why, in some sense, choice and bargaining power or bargaining leverage is a form of power. And it may go some lengths to explaining why 8 out of 10, not all, but 8 out of 10 ASEAN economies um, uh, managed to trend upwards um, in, in, in the region. The uncertainty that that creates um, forces choices, but choice is a form of power. And we saw that with the increased degrees of opposition that uh, President Xi Jinping's flagship Belt and Road Initiative has uh, engendered over the last year. Now, when it comes to uh, China's military capability, there's no question that actually things get more difficult. China's military rise is not linear. Um, it's spending a lot more money, um, but it's not just about creating new capability. It's about maintaining the capability you already have. And maintaining is a very costly endeavor, just ask the Americans. Uh, the more you build, the more you have to sustain at current levels. At the same time, wages for your armed forces become more expensive. And if you're going to be competing at the cutting edge of technology with the United States, you're going to be investing much more in your R&D. And so I think in some sense, the transitional phase that the PLA finds itself in, where it is actually cutting down the, the, its armed forces, um, where it has to contend with a region that is also doing more to hedge against China's military rise, explains why there is that small dip in its military capability score uh, from last year. Whether that is a dip that becomes a longer term trend, too soon to tell, I would doubt it. But it does serve to remind us that China's rise in, 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 in a military domain or any other domain is not linear or, or um, uh, self-sustaining. It's, it's, it's going to be a challenge. Can I pick up, I'm going to come back to the point that Prof Bajpai made about the relative decline of, of um, the Western powers in terms of their, in terms of their rankings. Um, I mean, you can see at a global level too that if Western countries could get their act together, as it were, if they were all of one mind, if they were better coordinated, mm -hmm. in terms of economic size, military capabilities, then they're a very formidable network. And I think that, that applies um, in Asia as well. The problem is, or one problem is, that the current President of the United States is a sceptic towards alliances. He's not really interested in... Um, 
he's not interested in, it appears, in, for example, half-submerged water features on the other side of the world. He's not focused on that, that sort of stuff. And it, my observation is that countries that have been beneficiaries of the US-led order in Asia and around the world have actually been slow to respond to this stimulus. They've been slow to stand up and say, OK, if the United States is less interested in supporting this order, what can we do? So, I guess, so maybe I can ask anyone on the panel who's interested, um, what would it take to shake uh, some of these countries out of their torpor, do you think, um, and, and do more to support an order that to date has, has benefited, benefited them? You mean the countries in Asia? Yep. OK. Uh, actually, I mean, we are seeing Japan step up in yes. certain, certain mm -hmm. ways. Yep. I think the, uh, the mantra of the countries in uh, East Asia, especially uh, in Southeast Asia, ASEAN, has been that they really do not want to choose mm -hmm. between the US and China. Right? But uh, I've been making the point that as the uh, geopolitical rivalry intensifies, uh, choose they probably will have to. Right? There'll be strong pressures from the US and from China asking them uh, where is, to who you know, uh, are you, you know, uh, going to align with? If you signed up for the Belt and Road Initiative, all right, for the so-called win-win cooperation, I mean, can anyone in Southeast Asia afford not to sign up, right, on this particular issue? Or if you say, don't let Huawei into your telco infrastructure, because if you do that, you risk uh, losing U.S. intelligence. Well. Those are choices that countries here will have to make. And from their choices, you probably will get a sense of the uh, moving future alignments. Now, Southeast Asia's choices uh, matter greatly for the superpowers because it is about forging a winning coalition on the political diplomatic front. If almost all of the ASEAN countries were to side with one of the superpowers, it will severely undermine the power or influence of the other, not just in Asia, but also globally. For example, in places like the UN uh, and the WTO. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I would just say that I guess everyone has um, pretty much already made a choice about how it's going to play the game between the United States and China, which is, uh, I mean, I think even India now, um, uh, which is to play a hedging game. Um, and to use the very fact that it is an increasingly bipolar order to, by threatening to tilt either this way or that way, increase its own bargaining room. Um, so, I mean, just to take the example of India, you can see how it flirts with China when it's under pressure from the Americans, as it is today, over trade, visas, uh, differences over Afghanistan, differences over how to work with Iran, uh, and even uh, over arms purchases from Russia. So the Wuhan opening to China um, and, and all of that is a signal to the Americans that if you're not more helpful, we're going to tilt somewhat back uh, to China. And I think when India's under too much pressure from China, it, it begins to tilt towards the Americans. And Southeast Asians have done that very, very well. So I think that, I mean, contrary to what you say about shake them out of their torpor. I mean, I think they have quite actively figured out how to live in this new world. Um, and they're seeing a regional order where, you know, they'll use the bipolar competition to tilt somewhat this way and tilt somewhat that way uh, in order to increase their own bargaining room. Mm. And I think it'd be interesting to see what the Chinese and the Americans do in an order where no one's going to commit very decisively to either mm. power. But just to exploit that space. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Prof. No, no, but just, just to play devil's advocate, um, you, can, you can play that hedging game when both superpowers are engaged in the great game in Asia. But isn't the danger for many Asian states that if the United States does, does step back from the region, if a re-elected President Trump or a future president says, why are we involved with these commitments on the other side of the world, then isn't it a much less congenial strategic environment for... Uh, for most Asian states, in the sense that there's one huge resident power that dominates, and it's harder to play, play the two off, because none of us want to live in the shade of one big state. Is, is that a danger that, that 
if, if we're not too careful, we may drive the Americans away and then find ourselves in a more difficult strategic circumstance? Well, I'll just say very briefly, I mean, I came back from a conference in China and it seemed to me the, the burden of, of judgment there was that the United States was not uh, retrenching uh, from Asia at all. I mean, there were still troops in Japan, in South Korea. Uh, uh, American ships are quite aggressively patrolling in and present in the South China Sea and the East Japan Sea. Um, there's, uh, uh, the Americans, through FOIP, the Free and Open Indo-Pacific, are making a play to sort of uh, come back and establish a presence on everything from infrastructure to trade and so on in Asia. So they didn't see a, an American retrenchment. Um, and I think we're probably being a bit too quick uh, and being carried away by you know, Trump's tweets. In fact, on the ground, uh, he, he's, uh, the Americans are present and he's, he, he hasn't taken them away. So uh, I would say that that bipolar structure will remain and we'll have these countries continue to, to exploit this. Uh, so I, I'm not as worried perhaps as you are. Can I jump in? Yes. Or, uh, I think one shouldn't take for granted that, uh, let's say, the majority of states in Southeast Asia will be uh, very against a situation where you have one dominant uh, power in uh, Southeast Asia. I mean, uh, during the Cold War, they were quite happy to live with American hegemony, provided America provided the goods, the security goods and the economic goods, right? So uh, in today's world, I can imagine uh, Southeast Asians doing their calculations in such a way that they may go with uh, the one who can provide them uh, with their economic growth, all right? or for that matter, uh, there'll be still some lingering strategic distrust, say, of China. But if China is the economic wave of the future, and if uh, you know, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, can bring everyone up, the calculations may be such that, uh, you know, and if America indeed all right, for domestic political reasons, uh, will have uh, reservations about being the world policeman. Uh, the Southeast Asians may do their calculations accordingly and say, no, uh, so long as you continue to make a good living and we are strategically, you know, uh, either way you have to, uh, you know, answer to a higher authority, makes, doesn't make that much of a difference. Let me bring Bonnie Bly into the discussion if I can. Earlier, Bonnie, uh, one of the, the panellists was talking about behaviour at the United Nations. And I think that's one of the new indicators that we've introduced this year. What Can you take us through some of the changes that have happened in the 2019 index as opposed to 2018 and some of the findings that that that, that produced? Yeah, sure. So um, this year we added uh, 13 indicators to our total number. So we've got 126 now. Um, and as you mentioned, one of the things we included was UN voting alignment. We also take into consideration refined fuel um, security. We thought that was really critical. Uh, we also look at strategic ambition, which I think uh, would be of interest to you, Professor Kong. Um, but yeah, the UN, the UN voting alignment results have been fascinating. What we found was that generally uh, minor powers tend to band together much more at the UN. So what we're looking at is how often do two countries vote yes, yes together, no, no, or abstain, abstain together. Um, and the results really show that countries like Mongolia, Sri Lanka, Nepal band together on the multilateral level. And unsurprisingly, the most rogue actor was the United States. So its average alignment with the other countries in Asia was only at 26%. Um, and even with its allies, it was pretty low. So its closest um, sort of aligned voting partner at the UN was Australia, but that was only at 64%. Um, so the United States, pretty rogue actor when it comes to these, these votes in the Asian context, um, not looking at sort of non-Asian voting partners. Now, China is a particularly interesting case uh, when it comes to UN voting alignment. There we found, so the common narrative tends to be um, that China is you know, swaying uh, countries in the region to vote with it at the UN in exchange for you know, economic investment, uh, using its clout, basically. Um, our results didn't actually show that at all. So in fact, as Hervé is showing here, um, China's most important partners in terms of its voting alignment were Russia and North Korea. So Russia and North Korea tend to vote in alignment with China at the UN. But if you have a look at all of Southeast Asia, the alignment is extremely low. Uh, obviously, the US allies don't align with China, but nor does Southeast Asia. And that actually suggests that the narratives that we tend to hear, if you look at the data and you look at this quite rich bilateral flows between countries, you'll see um, really <laughs> it's, it's not what we thought it was. Mm. 
All right, let me, what I'd like to do now is go to the audience if I can. I have lots of other questions I'd like to ask, but we, we, we want to keep moving. So we want to give people an opportunity to ask questions of the panel. There are microphones arranged, and I'm hoping that any minute there'll be a rush of people to the, to the microphone. Thank you. <laughs> if you can't rely on the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School, who can you rely on? <coughs> Professor, Professor Kwa. Thank you very much for the presentation and the panel discussion. It's been hugely interesting and extremely valuable for us to recalibrate our thinking about what's happening in the region. I wanted to pick up on uh, one of the, the remarks that Hervey made early on in the presentation, and that has figured implicitly in some of the panel conversation. And that remark was, we are, you know, global order is moving from what it used to be, an open consensus-based system, to one now marked by competition and zero-sum thinking. I hope I'm not misparaphrasing, but I think those are some of the key phrases you introduced into this. And I am curious how we go from the understanding of what's happening in terms of the API, Asia Power Index, to that kind of a statement. So three points I might make in particular. First is uh, competition is, of course, not synonymous with zero-sum outcomes. Competition in a marketplace is good. Competition in the globalized trading system is good. Competition among universities is good. We're all driven to higher levels of achievement. So I'm curious about how you see the outline of this identification of greater competition and zero-sum thinking. The second point I might make is that this comes tantalizingly on the heels of the statement about how we're moving from a transatlantic dominated four of the five largest economies world to one where the center of gravity, as it were, is more in Asia. And I'm curious if there are connections to be made there. Uh, then, okay, well, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Terrific points. Herve, do you want to kick off? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, it, it takes us back to uh, the contradictions because there are so many contradictory trends here. Um, one is that, yes, uh, uh, coalitions are what is, what is required or what will be required by either the United States or China to prevail as the predominant power in Asia. And yet both powers seem in some sense uh, challenged by the, by, you know, challenged in their ability to, to build these durable coalitions of countries. And it isn't that the U.S. is withdrawing geopolitically from Asia. I don't think it is at all. Uh, I, I think it's, it's a very present actor. Uh, I think its alliance system is still robust. We don't just count the number of treaty allies it has. We also assess the health of those relationships, and they are healthy. But it is the fact that whilst the U.S. is still a status quo power in terms of wanting to maintain its geopolitical advantages, it has become, uh, in Gideon Rackman's word, because this is an op-ed he produced a week ago, a revisionist power in terms of its economic uh, and trade agenda. And there is a contradiction there in seeking to build alliances geopolitically, but playing your economics unilaterally, uh, especially when the trade war isn't just tar targeted at China, but also targeted at allies like Japan. So the same kind of contradiction holds for China. China is trying to build coalitions of the willing in terms of its economic diplomacy. That's what BRI is all about. It is a status quo power, uh, not a revisionist power, it's a status quo power on uh, economic diplomacy. It wants to see the World Trade Organization maintained. It wants to see deepening integration because that's exactly what uh, the conditions that have allowed China to, to, to rise in the first place but it has become a revisionist power geopolitically. And insofar as it's a revisionist power geopolitically in the South China Sea with 11 neighbors that it still has outstanding um, boundary disputes with or legacies of, co of conflict with, um, there is a trust deficit uh, confronting China as well. So these are contradictory trends. And I think, again, I would make the slightly counterintuitive argument in the absence of either superpower to build durable coalitions in the presence of the contradictions that exist in their foreign policies, there is actually room for maneuver here among middle powers. But middle powers will have to play a much smarter game to maintain their comparative advantage. We've seen that from Japan. We're not seeing it from every country. 
Would anyone else like to jump in on those? Prof. Well, I, I mean, just on Danny's point, I mean, I think um, you can see that when the United States and China is competitive, um, it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, close off all the space and is not necessarily all negative for smaller powers. Because I, as I was trying to suggest, they're, they're exploiting it. They're trying to exploit both powers uh, to their advantage. I think Yun Fong thinks that the polarization is going to force uh, smaller countries to choose, and that would, in fact, be not such a great outcome. But we'll have to see. I mean, there's a balance between whether they're inclined to do that uh, or whether they're clever enough to exploit the, the, the distance between the two powers to their advantage. And I think that's going to probably vary, and, and their diplomatic smarts are going to, to, to show in, 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 in whether they can exploit that. So I think that's... that's uh, so I think, and one could make a larger argument about the benefits of competition between, even between the United States and, and, uh, the, uh, uh, and China, which is just to say that, you know, in the effort that national societies have to put into competition, I mean, they improve their efficiencies and competitiveness and, and, and so on. They get more integrated societies and so forth. So uh, competition between great powers may not all be bad, um, you know, if they don't exceed certain limits. Let me, yes, Aaron Connolly of IISS. Thanks, Michael, and uh, thanks, Irvay and Bonnie, for another great product uh, with this year's edition of the Asia Power Index. I have a question for both of you. Um, I think one aspect that perhaps gets lost in this region it, when we talk about the decoupling uh, that we've been seeing emerge over the last couple of years is human rights. Um, and I'm curious as to how two countries in particular that have had human rights issues over the last couple of years uh, have fared in the Asia Power Index, and that's, that's Myanmar. Uh, with you know, 10,000 um, Muslim Rohingya having been killed in, in Rakhine State. Um, has that affected Myanmar's soft power at all? And, and Bonnie, in particular, has it affected um, voting at the UN in terms of uh, who aligns with Myanmar, that sort of thing? Um, sanctions, economic sanctions, has that affected them at all? Uh, and then the bigger one, which is uh, China and the uh, uh, one to two million Uyghurs who are interned in Xinjiang. Has that affected China at all, or have people just overlooked that? Has it affected their power, their measures of soft power, anything like that? Thanks very much. So I think um, on Myanmar, it is actually, uh, Aaron and I share a Myanmar uh, interest. Uh, uh, it is, uh, you, you can actually see a small, let me just try to find it, it's so tiny. Uh, and that's already half the story of Myanmar. It's such a large country, and yet it's such an underperformer in the region because it's so inward looking. Um, its strongest performance, I think, is in military capability, but its military capability is geared at domestic uh, security threats, not uh, trying to compete with, uh, with uh, powers outside of uh, its borders. Um, and I think what we've seen is, if you want to look at some trends, um, that Myanmar has dropped uh, in terms of its cultural influence and in terms of its uh, diplomatic influence as well. Uh, and where is that coming from? It's coming from a diplomatic network, which takes on board um, things like um, the efficacy of embassies, or it's just a lot of data points here, but also it's multilateral power where we have looked at voting alignment uh, in particular, and um, that is also, so it's trending down for that. Now, I mean, it, it raises a bigger question because I think Myanmar is the only country in Southeast Asia um, to have had over 60 years of uninterrupted internal conflict. And why is that important to our assessment of power? Because you need to be able to have uh, domestic governance uh, in order to be able to, as, as a baseline, uh, in order to be able to compete uh, and, and advance your interests abroad. In the absence of uh, institutional stability, you actually, or a country, becomes more vulnerable uh, to being influenced uh, from abroad. We, Myanmar has a, a long-standing uh, history of uh, uh, proxy warfare from Thailand, from China, um, and now proxy warfare in terms of being supported by organized crime, so it's not all state-based, but all of these things are debilitating. Now, coming back to China, it's exactly the same, the, the exact same principle applies. So one of the eight measures of power, and I always think it's, it's the most underappreciated, um, is this concept of resilience that we've got. Um, because by that we mean the, the ability of countries to withstand threats to their stability. And one of the core pillars of that is something called institutional stability. Why does it matter uh, 
that China's confronting atrocities in Xinjiang from our perspective. I mean, it matters in terms of human rights, it matters in terms of value, uh, value-based diplomacy, but it also matters because a large uh, proportion of uh, spending towards security in China is actually geared at a domestic threat as opposed to an external threat. And uh, things become more difficult. So one of the conclusions we make is that the biggest challenge to China's rise is not necessarily the United States, it's itself. It faces uh, distrust in the region. It also faces internal challenges, such as the fact that it you know, has these conflicts taking place, it's heavy-handed response to them, but also uh, fundamentally, demographically, it's an aging society. Uh, and that means that its working age population will diminish by about 158 million people by 2045. Um, that means a far less productive workforce. That also means that the <coughs> burden of expectations on the Communist Party changes uh, towards enhanced public goods as opposed to um, uh, un, uh, so as a huge uh, ec economic growth rates. So we think the challenges for China are substantial uh, and, and they add to uh, um, its uh, probably the fact that it could probably level with the United States but not necessarily surpass the United States as being the undisputed uh, leader in our region. Oni, I want to give you a chance to speak as well. Yes, so what you raise is, is quite interesting. So you're, you're suggesting that um, Myanmar's voting alignment would have generally gone down in the region uh, as a result of the human rights atrocities. And as Hervé mentioned, uh, the results show it does slightly, yes. Um, but in general, it still has a really high result. Um, and that's because its neighboring countries still band together with it. And uh, often the, the UN voting patterns can be quite, it can be quite benign depending on the issue. So um, in, in, in many cases, you'll find it doesn't matter what the issue is, they will band together. Um, and then in certain topics, so for example, on the South China Sea, China will, ex like, uh, it will ramp up its um, pressure on certain partners to vote a certain way. So it would be really interesting to then take all this sort of bilateral voting data and then link it back to the issue areas that they're looking at in specific resolutions. And to do that, you really need to do it over a few years as well. So we've only done this uh, for the first time this year. Um, but I think there will be some pretty interesting correlations between issue areas and then, uh, as you said, human rights atrocities, things like that. It is interesting to see North Korea there uh, ranked among the top voting partners for Myanmar. Yeah. <laughs> Let me, we've got time for two more questions. What I might do is take both of the questions at once and then give everybody on the panel the opportunity to, to choose like, a, like food from a buffet, uh, what, what they would like to answer. So, sir. Hi, I'm Associate Professor Terence Lee from the Department of Political Science at the National University of Singapore. So my question is largely about the drivers um, that uh, you see with respect to the rise and the fall in the index. You've had two years now to um, discern some, some trends about countries that are going up and countries that are going down. So I want to put forth to the um, lead researchers of the index and as well of course to the panelists, um, what do you think are the key drivers of, um, uh, of countries that are going up or going down? Um, are they more domestic? Are they more transnational, like something like globalization? Thank you. Terrific question. And yes, one of my colleagues from the Institute, Ben Bland. Thanks, Michael. So my question uh, relates to the point Hervé was making about China's weaknesses. You said that nothing short of war could stop the rise of China relative to the US. But given all those concerns, we know that the economy is also slowing because of the trade war. China's faced increased pushback around the world. It's got domestic problems in Xinjiang, in Hong Kong. Isn't there a risk that you're overestimating uh, China's rise and you're underestimating a lot of the fragilities of the system in your model? Thanks. Excellent. I might, Prof Kong, do you want to address either of those questions? Uh, about the drivers or about yeah, the weaknesses? I have a thought of, of on China. Uh, yeah. Darren's question. Please. Uh, in, actually, I was less in, uh, concerned about the uh, ups or downs in this one or two years. Because uh, to me, this is very unlike the Times Higher Education ranking of world universities, you know, where every year, you know, universities jump uh, many spaces. What I really uh, appreciate about this particular uh, index is that if you look at the things that really count, positions one, two, three, four, five, six, no change. All right. So to me, the more impressive finding is that actually, uh, the US and China, according to uh, the index, remain the two superpowers in the region. Right? 
that explains a lot of the things that have been happening in the last five years to me. Uh, I'm happy. I'm a happy camper. Canty. <laughs> mm. yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I would throw in the technology issue for China. It's not very clear. That, uh, there's quite a lot of unease over this Huawei affair and what it means. And I think this idea that China has now got every technology covered and it doesn't really matter uh, if the Americans uh, place these sanctions and, and so on on them. Uh, it's all internally driven. I think that's not going to be the case. And if China wants to get out of the middle income trap and get to the next level, uh, it will have to pay a lot of attention to the technology issue. And I would say, I mean, just to be provocative, that the Americans are testing the proposition that economic interdependence between China and the United States is so deep that it cannot, in fact, be challenged. And decoupling is exactly that challenge. I mean, I think the Bannon-led group are sort of saying, um, we can decouple. It'll hurt the Chinese more than it'll hurt us. And if it uh, slows Chinese growth, it could affect internal Chinese uh, you know, political stability and call into question uh, the role of the Communist Party. So they're drawing a parallel to how the containment game ended in the Soviet Union. Mm. They fell behind technologically, further and further behind, and it got to a point where the Soviet Union unraveled. Uh, so I think they're playing a much uh, deeper game. They may be proved entirely wrong because China seems to be much more dynamic economically. But I think we'll have to watch. This trade war isn't a trade war. It's really a technology war. And so we'll really have to see how much uh, the American technology denial um, uh, kind of uh, attempt is, is going to harm the Chinese economy or, or not. And the only other point I would make, which is not really related to the questions, is that, um, but I suppose it is in a way, which is, is very impressive that all the Southeast Asian economies uh, are doing very well. And, and these countries are rising in power. And it, it does suggest that something to do with kind of economic regimes in these countries is the driver of their dynamism. Part of that is the link to China and the China market. Uh, and maybe BRI will further boost their dynamism. But it does look like they're going to be a, an enormous force for economic change and dynamism in Asia for quite a long time. Bonnie. Yeah, so the question of change in the index is a really interesting one. And I can tell you we were sweating bullets the day that the final results came out because we didn't know what it would look like until um, we got the final numbers. You know, every single final data point was, was finished up. Um, and we were quite happy with the outcome because on the top level, there isn't much movement. So there's just been two ranking changes. So North Korea takes over the Philippines and Laos takes over, um, overtakes Mongolia. Um, so quite minor on the ranking side. But then if you go below that level and look at the measures, that's where the movement's happening. And as you'd expect, there's movement, uh, there's less movement where it's about the structural underpinnings of a state's power. So when we're talking about its geopolitical stability, its, um, you know, its resources, you know, all those basic fundamentals, uh, demographics, these things, unless you have like a one-child policy, uh, one policy, they're not going to change overnight. Um, then the, the most movement and the biggest surprises we saw in our results were in the diplomatic influence measure. And that is also to be expected. That's because you know, you're talking about the mood of the day, the individual at the helm. You're talking about how effective is the country's diplomacy, how ambitious is it being strategically. And on those fronts, um, you, know, you, would ex you would hope for a bit more movement. And, and we also took in some um, qualitative assessments there to incorporate um, those changes. Um, so yeah, I think we were, we were quite happy to say that. And one more point to add as well is when you, when you go through the index at home, you'll see we were really careful in distinguishing between um, you know, ranking changes and, and score trends. So a country can actually be trending downwards in its score, but overtake another country in its rank. And that's because we're looking at relative power. So it's not enough for you as a country to be massively, um, you know, to be, to, well, you can actually be very stable as a country, but if your context is changing, your relative power is changing, our results will change. And I think that as well makes, makes sense from a methodological and a theoretical point of view as well. Hervé, you've got the last word. Just uh, on this Cold War, I think the idea, can we even call it a new Cold War? Uh, if it is one, it will, it will be different in two ways. I, I agree with you. The US is testing the proposition that interdependence can be weaponized. 
And that is actually different to the last Cold War. We were dealing with distinct economic uh, spheres of influence. Here we are dealing with interdependencies, mutual vulnerabilities, and the US has decided to escalate. So that's one point of departure with the last Cold War. The second point of departure, I think, is the fact that keep in mind the Soviet Union had a GDP that was smaller than Japan by the 1980s. So the US could leverage its larger economy um, very successfully and outspend, essentially, the Russians. Here, we're dealing with the reverse dynamic. China is the emerging market. Uh, it will be larger, despite challenges to its growth rate. Um, and it can, self, it can sustain its economic growth because of this domestic uh, consumption. So that's the, th the, the second point of difference. The third point of difference, which probably explains why we shouldn't even call it a new Cold War, is that I don't think we will have fixed blocks. I think Southeast Asia and the region will remain promiscuous uh, between two superpowers locked in, 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 in rivalry with each other. And as far as both superpowers have an inability, politically, structurally, to build these coalitions, there will be opportunity for others to opportunize on, uh, on, on, on the uncertainty. Um, I, I want to thank a couple of people. I want to thank again um, Danny for hosting us today and Prof Kong and Prof Badgepai. It's wonderful to be here at the Lee Kuan Yew School talking about big fish and small fish and, and shrimps. Uh, and I particularly want to thank again Hervé and Bonnie. Perfect timing as always. Um, I want to thank Hervé and Bonnie and I want to invite everybody here to come to the lobby next door where we'll, we'll be having drinks. You can sense, I think, how much these guys love talking about the index. They've been closeted for a year doing nothing but the index. So please come and talk, come and ask some questions, and, and please come and have a drink with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.